Good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing tonight? Good. You I guess unfortunately get to hear me back to back on Sunday nights. Sorry about that. It's just kind of how it's worked out, I guess. But I'm still grateful for the opportunity to be here and speak. Last week, you know, I absolutely love my mama. Love her to death. Last week, though, when I spoke, she came and my aunt came and my brother. And last week I spoke and I was wearing jeans and t-shirt was pretty casual. And my mama got on to me. She said, what are you doing wearing that, Ross? And I was like, it's okay, mom. It's, it's fine. And so this week I decided to dress a little bit more casual in honor of her. So that's why I'm wearing a tie and a little bit more dressed up. Several years ago, back when I was in college, I think it was my second year out of college on summer break, I had an opportunity to do an internship. And it was at a church called Etheridge Church of Christ in Etheridge, Tennessee. If you're not familiar with where Etheridge is at, it's a little tiny town real close to Lawrenceburg, right outside of Lawrenceburg. Kind of a big Amish community lives there. And it's a neat little town, and I was able to work as an intern for the youth group there at Etheridge Church of Christ for the summer. And I absolutely loved my time there. It was a great place. And, but while I was staying there and working there, one of the things that I did was every two weeks or maybe every week I would stay and live with a different family. So one week I was here and then I would pack all my stuff up and go stay with another family from week to week or every two weeks. I mean, it was pretty neat. It was neat to be able to stay and live and be with members of the congregation there at Etheridge. And my very first place that I stayed, I'll never forget for many reasons. It was on a farm and even though I'm from McMinnville and even though I was born in Viola, and my parents were farmers for a little while, and I've got farming background. I grew up on a farm for four years, and then we moved to the city of McMinnville, big city of McMinnville. And so I'm not necessarily a country boy. I'm more of a man of the cloth. That's how I like to uh, reference myself. But I do have a little bit of a background in it. But for the first two weeks in Etheridge, I lived on a legit farm. And they had every kind of animal imaginable. Animals I'd never seen before. They had these massive, like, you know, they had the normal animals like cows and horses and stuff like that, pigs. They had these massive, huge turtles. I mean, I'm talking like big turtles. They had probably the weirdest animal ever, a peacock. And I remember the very first night I was there, I thought there was a little kid outside like screaming, like they were being killed or something. And it was that peacock making those weird noises. But they had a garden and all that stuff, these people I lived with. And it was actually... A little bit down the road from Etheridge, they lived in Summertown. I believe that's what it's called, Summertown. But I'll never forget all that stuff, but I'll also never forget the salsa that the lady who lived there made. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was such good salsa. I really like salsa. Lacey really likes salsa. We go to Mexican restaurants all the time because we like salsa. But it was just really good salsa. She grew, you know, homegrown tomatoes, Roma tomatoes, and cilantro and onion it was just always so fresh and so good i just remember sitting at their counter just you know destroying that sauce of chip after chip it was just so good and when you think about that though you know the way she made that those ingredients you know that food came from a living source right at one time those tomatoes were living they were you know nutrients and when they were disconnected from that plant where they were growing you know they died and they lost everything right you know that's kind of how it works and the fresher the food usually the better it is and it's a lot better for us to eat fresh foods and foods that are grown you know it's not good for us to live on a diet of just twinkies i don't know you know how long we would live if we just ate twinkies for the rest of the time because you know twinkies aren't you know from real food <laughs> And so there's this principle that the death of this one thing gives life to another thing, right? Our survival, our, you know, being, our life is dependent on the death of another living thing. You know, we have to have those foods that were at one time living to keep us living. And that's kind of how it is with our spiritual life. Matthew 10, 39, whoever finds their life will lose it and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. You ever find yourself telling a story about yourself in a particular way to make yourself look better? I don't know how many of you have ever done that. I know there's been times in my life where I've done that. You emphasize certain details where it makes you look better and it makes you stand out and the story builds you up. For many of us, 
that impulse is built within us, okay? And we do that. But that's not how we're called to live, where our lives are emphasized on us. Jesus invites that part of ourself to die, right? Uh, that's kind of the gospel call. That's kind of what it means when we decide to tap into a relationship with Jesus. And so for the past several weeks, one of the things we've been doing with our teenagers is we've been studying the book of Ephesians. And so tonight what I want us to do, giving you that kind of setting and that kind of introduction, I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 1. And I want to give you a little taste of what we've been talking about uh, with our young people and our students for the past couple weeks. But before we get to that, one of the main themes of this year since I've been here with our young people, and that's what I'm going to try to do is year to year is make sure we have a theme when we, you know, go start a new year or, you know, start something new. And that theme for us this year is the fact that we were created in the image of God. You know, that comes from Genesis. And we've really been focusing on that, hitting that hard. And what really goes along with that and what's been going along with our study in Ephesians is our identity, okay, is who we are and what it means and what we're made of. And so that whole verse where it says we were created in the image of God goes right along with this focus on identity. And so in Ephesians has really tied, you know, in with what our main theme for the year has been. When you look at the theme for the book of Ephesians, I really believe that the theme for that book is the relationship between Christ and the church. If you really dive into Ephesians, that's what you see, is you see just the relationship between Christ and the church. You know, one can think of it this way as Christ being the groom, the church being his bride. You know, we all have heard that before. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, I feel like it's kind of the main focus, main theme verse for the whole entire book. It says, He died so that he could give the church to himself like a bride in all her beauty. He died so that the church could be pure and without fault, with no evil or sin or any other wrong thing in it. So this theme of Ephesians goes right along with our focus that we've been focusing on for the year as a youth group of identity. And so tonight I want us just to dive into it just a little bit for just a few minutes and think about the first chapter of Ephesians. We're going to read that and we're going to look into it. But the main thing I want you to think about tonight is the word blessed. Okay, the word blessed. And I'm going to go about this a little differently. Usually I have several points and, you know, kind of stick to those points. And what I want to do tonight is I really want us to get the passage, Ephesians 1, 1 through 14. And I want us to really dissect that passage for the few minutes that we have. But I want you, as we do this and as we think about this, I want you to just keep that key thought of we are blessed in Christ. Okay, we are blessed in Christ. I think that word is tossed around a lot in Christianity. And I think I've talked a little bit about that before. You know, we talk about we're so blessed to be in this country, a citizen of this country, which is absolutely a great statement and true. You know, we live in the South, so no matter if that baby is ugly or not ugly, we always say bless their heart. You know, that's our phrase to get by with anything. But we use that term blessed all the time. And sometimes it's not the right reason. I did this a couple, I guess it's been a couple years. I did it with a youth group one time, but I uh, got a pebble and I brought somebody up in front of the class and I took, well, I think it was maybe a handful of pebbles, and I gave them the handful of pebbles, and I told them, take your shoe off and put all these pebbles in your shoe. And they said, okay. And so they put them on their shoe, and then I gave them a really big sucker and said, here, I want you to have this sucker. And they said, okay. And then I said, I want you to put your shoe on and then walk around for a little bit. So they put their shoe on, they walked around, and then I asked them the question. I said, what was it like for you to walk around like that? And... The answer was, you know, it hurt. I couldn't take it. The pebbles hurt my foot. It was just a, a horrible experience. I didn't like walking around with those rocks in my shoes, Ross. It was horrible. And didn't say a single thing about the fact that I gave them a sucker. And I think a lot of times, or most of the time, very often, we fail to realize God's blessings because we're too focused on the struggle of life. Sometimes we call that, you know, we call it the struggle bus. We're having a bad day. We're on the struggle bus. And I think a lot of times we focus too much on the struggle bus than the blessings that God rains down upon us continually. And so if you got your Bibles, let's flip over to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to read these 14 verses and then we're going to kind of dissect them. Keep in your mind this idea of we are blessed in Christ. So we'll start with Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1 and go through verse 14. 
Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth, in Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also... When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Wow. A lot is going on in this passage. These verses ring so true to, I think, all of us in here. And if you really think about it, really look at it, you may can even get a little sentimental because this is, uh, this is so important to us. There's huge words in there like blessings, forgiveness, predestined, inheritance, all are, you know, all these words that are very, very important and mean a lot to us. So what I want us to do is I really want us to tear this apart, tear this passage apart for just a few minutes and think about some questions that go along with this passage. So in verses three through six, what are some blessings we have in Jesus Christ? What are some blessings we have in Jesus Christ as we looked at? At verses 3 through 6. I think that the biggest thing I see is the fact that we are chosen in Christ before everything was made. And that right there goes right back to we were created in His image. So powerful. That is such a big deal. Is that God chose us. That's a blessing. And a lot of times we forget that or we don't take it and respect it or understand it enough. A lot of times we take that for granted. This was the plan from the very beginning. We are blessed with holiness and blamelessness. What does it mean to be holy and to be without blame? It means that not only are we clean and pure, but in a court system we've been found not guilty. Okay, what an amazing truth that is. We also have His grace. That's another blessing we see from this. We have His grace. How is grace a blessing? Well... I think we all, you know, a lot of us in here know the definition of grace. Getting what we do not deserve. And what do we all in here deserve? I think we all know that. And so that grace right there is a blessing. If we jump down to the next verse, verse 7. What's so special about the forgiveness of sins? And I know that's a, an easy thing to think about. You know, Ross, if I don't have forgiveness, I don't have, you know, anything really. And that's true. But I think that, you know, that's an obvious answer but think about it this way. Two people get into an argument. One person was wrong and the other person was right. The person who was right knew it and had something against the person who was wrong. The person who was wrong felt bad and wanted to be forgiven. But the person who was right would not let things go. He would make him feel like junk. He would badger him, belittle him all because he was right in an argument. And the other person was wrong. Think about this. What if God was that way and held things against us? He's not, though. He could be, but he's not. Forgiveness of sins means God has released us from our bondage. And he has set us absolutely free. He doesn't hold it against us. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Verse 8. There's a word in verse 8. It says, he lavished these things upon us. Lavished. That's an interesting word. The word used here is a word that is typically used in the New Testament to mean something that is more than enough or something that is extremely rich. Paul is saying that all of the blessings that God has given us, those blessings, we are made rich because of them. 
So all the blessings that God has given us and rained down upon us, we're made rich because of those. When we think of rich, we don't think of what God thinks about when he thinks of rich. When we think about rich, we think about money or we think about possessions. And it's not like that with our relationship with God. He lavished. I mean, that word is just so powerful. Paul is saying that all the blessings that God has given us were made rich. It would be like the difference, you know, there's a difference in not having anything and having something. And through Jesus, we have everything. And that's what Paul is trying to make us realize. In the New Living Translation, it's worded like this. He has showered his kindness on us. What a feeling. I mean, that's powerful. Verse 9, next verse. Why is God's will a mystery? How has that mystery been revealed? That's what I was thinking about when we look at verse 9. I think a lot of times we think that his mystery and his will has not been made clear to us. You know, if you ask someone on the street, you know, what's the mystery, God's will and God's mystery and and that kind of stuff, they're going to be confused and have no earthly idea. But the mystery has been revealed in Christ. Christ is the one who has fulfilled all things. And now that mystery that talks about in this passage, it transforms our life. The mystery is the gospel. There's other verses we can look like in Romans and Colossians, but... We have salvation in Jesus, and we have a Savior who gave it all. If we look at verses 11 and 12, God predestined us, which means He chose us from the beginning to be blessed. How did He do that? And I know a lot of times when we hear the word predestined, we get nervous, or we think, uh, you know, that's crazy talk. Uh, We don't talk about that stuff. But as we think about the word predestined in this passage, it specifically means that he chose us back to Genesis. God created us in his image. From the beginning, God chose us to live a life that was in a relationship with him. And that's what it's talking about in this verse. God has a plan that's fail-proof. It can't mess up. It can't fail. It's all worked out. You know, there's lots of plans that people have created over the years to make things happen, and they said from the beginning that it was not fail-proof. You know, a great example is the Titanic, right? You know, that was the unsinkable ship. It was fail-proof. It it was not going to sink. What happened? It sank. And God has given us, chosen us, and given us a way and a purpose that's fail-proof. Through Jesus, He did all this. So, what does it mean to be chosen by God? What does it mean to be chosen by God? Why is it important to be chosen by God? Because being chosen by God gives us identity. I mean, it gives us ownership. In this world, there's so many people who, you know, give titles to people and say this because people do this and, and your identity is in this and your identity is that. You know, you like to study all the time, so you're a nerd. You, you know, you play sports, so you're a jock. You're, you know, on the computer all the time, so you're a nerd or you're an IT guy. You know, there's all these titles and these things where we supposedly find identity but god said i knew your identity before you're even born i knew your purpose before you're even born and that's where we find our identity according to verse 13 we are guaranteed an inheritance why is it important to have a guarantee the trademark statement from george zimmer i don't know if you know who that is that's the guy on the men's warehouse commercials, if you've ever seen those. Um, He says, you're going to like the way you look, I guarantee it. That's the quote from the commercials. You're going to like the way you look, I guarantee it. The question is, how does he back his guarantee? A guarantee is only as good as the product you sell, right? You cannot guarantee something if what you have is not worth squat. You can't guarantee it. But we are guaranteed by God because... We've seen it happen. We've got proof. And he, from the beginning, he's laid it out for us. I'm a really big basketball fan. I like basketball a lot. I don't play as much as I used to, but I really like to watch basketball. And from a young age, I just really enjoyed it. I remember being in middle school and falling in love with the Dallas Mavericks. And the reason I fell in love with the Dallas Mavericks was because of a big, tall, white guy who took jump shots and made them all comparable to Larry Bird. The guy's name was Dirk Nowitzki. And I just thought it was neat to see a big white guy be successful in basketball uh, in the NBA. 
And so I've liked basketball for a long time. The owner of the Dallas Mavericks uh, is not a very liked guy. His name is Mark Cuban. He's a very wealthy man. He's been on that show Shark Tank and stuff like that. And several years ago, the owner, Mark Cuban, of the Dallas Mavericks offered WGN Chicago Radio Sports Talk host David Kaplan $50,000 to change his name legally to Dallas Mavericks. He said, I'll give you $50,000 if you legally change your name to Dallas Mavericks. And this is a guy out of Chicago, sports talk radio guy in Chicago on WGN. And at first, Kaplan said, I'm not going to do that, $50,000. I'm not going to do that. Cuban sweetened the deal and said, look, I'll give you $100,000 and then I'll donate $100,000 to your favorite charity. So, you know, he's pulling two strings. He said, I'm going to give a, a lot of money to your favorite charity. And, you know, this has gone public. And, you know, that's even a bigger deal if there's $100,000 going to a charity and you're also getting $100,000. And so he said, I'll do that, you know, if you'll just change your name just for even one year. So just for a year, I'll give you $100,000 and your favorite charity, $100,000. If you just change your name to Dallas Mavericks for one year. He did some soul searching, David Kaplan, and thought long and hard about it. And he was getting emails and emails from listeners saying, look, you know, it's just for a year. It's a lot of money. You know, it could even help a lot of people. But he eventually turned down the offer. And this is the words he said. I'd be saying I'd do anything for money. And that bothers me, Kaplan said. My name is my birthright. I'd like to preserve my integrity and credibility. So as we swing full circle with thinking about identity and thinking about who we are and who you are, my challenge to you tonight is that you will go to your homes, go to your jobs tomorrow if you're working, or you know, your families, and in every aspect of life, be able to say, my identity is in Jesus Christ and I am blessed through that. We are such a blessed people. I'm not trying to throw that word around. I'm not trying to just use it as a southern word. I'm trying to make us realize that in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul pours out his heart and says, look, we are blessed. Paul, through the Holy Spirit, makes us realize how blessed we are. So a couple questions I want you to think about. What am I doing to focus on the blessings of Christ rather than the sufferings that are going on in my life? What does being blessed look like in the daily aspects of my life? And how can I share my blessings with those around me? We are such a blessed people. And hopefully we'll understand that and realize that more as the days go by. Tonight, we're going to offer invitation like we always do. And if you have a need, we hope that you'll come. If you're not a believer and have been thinking about it and would like to give your life and start a relationship and discipleship with Jesus, we encourage you to do that tonight. If you just need to make some things right, we hope that you can do that. As John says, it's a place of peace, and we want to be here with you and support you in whatever you're going through. Whatever needs you have tonight, we ask that you come right now as we stand and as we sing.